Welcome to the Skeptic Zone, the podcast from Australia for science and reason. Yes, it's the Skeptic Zone podcast, episode number 730, for the 2nd of October 2022. Richard Saunders coming to you from Sydney, Australia. October, another month, another month to enjoy. If you've downloaded the Maynard calendar at maynard.com.au, you can enjoy October with Maynard. Now there's a thought, there's a thought. What's coming up on this week's show? We're going to kick off with an interview with an old friend of mine, Claire Klingenberg. Claire Klingenberg is the president of the European Council of Skeptical Organizations, and she is a guest speaker this year at Skepticon 2022 in Canberra, the first weekend of December. To find out what Claire's going to be talking about, and a bit of a catch-up as I interview Claire Klingenberg. Following that, it's a classic Bit of the Skeptic Zone from six years ago, Take Stock, with Shelley Stocken, our wonderful uh, reporter who died, sadly, not so long ago. But uh, she left us a wealth of wonderful reports, and they're always worth hearing again. From 2016, Does Naturopathy Work? The Truth About Natural Medicine. Then we have an update from our friends at the Center for Inquiry in the United States about their continuing battle with homeopathy, specifically the battle against Walmart and CVS pharmacies for selling homeopathy on their shelves. And closer to home, news from New South Wales about the uh, New South Wales health watchdog being given powers to shut down alternative health clinics, including naturopaths and chiropractors, for not complying with its code of conduct. Then to round off the show, back into the Trove archives, in a way, and we hand it over to Adrian Hill, our reporter from Canada, who this week looks at ghosts. Oh, her favourite topic. Oh yes, her favourite topic. Ghost stories from Canada in the digital news archives. And a big shout out to all those people out there who have just finished their holidays. Some people had a holiday over the last week or so here in Australia. And, uh, well, after the long weekend, it's a long weekend here in Australia, uh, Monday is a holiday for Labor Day. Some people will be heading back to work. So certainly thinking about you, and I really hope, I really hope you had a good break. But now it's time for me to run downstairs and break a few eggs. Yes, fried eggs on toast. Scrambled eggs? Maybe poached eggs. How do you like your eggs? Bit of salt, bit of pepper? While I do that, I hope you enjoy The Skeptic Zone. Joining me now, just near Prague. What a beautiful city Prague is. I've been there a couple of times over the year. Over the years, it's Claire Klingenberg. Hello, Claire. Hi. Nice to see you and talk to you again. Yes. Yes. In fact, we are through the magic of the internet. We're looking at each other. I suppose it's not such a big deal these days. But I'm old enough to remember when video conferencing just wasn't a thing. I, I think I don't know if it's a question of age. I've been traveling between Europe and the US my whole life, but I'm still shocked or just, just weirded out when I wake up in Prague and I go to sleep in the US. Like in, it's just so bizarre. <laughs> or you know, you get on the plane in the US and you and then you like wake up in Prague the next yeah. morning. It's it's strange. Oh, well, I mean, I've been doing that between the United States and um, Australia for many many years. Yeah. And, Every exactly, time, yeah. I agree, and the jet lag is horrible, and it's still very strange. <laughs> now, Claire, we ha- talking about the United States. The last time we saw each other, I'm sure, was in New York. I'm sure. True. It was. Yeah. <laughs> yes, at Nexus. At Nexus, and I think I, I mean that was the last time I had the pleasure of seeing James Randi. I don't know about you. 
Well, we saw each other at the Nexus in 2017. Mm -hmm. So then I saw him uh, at Nexus in 2018, I think. Right, right. And so I think that that was the last time I've seen him okay. in person. Yeah, it's still hard to believe he's he's not there. If we go to a, a skeptical convention somewhere, it's yeah. almost like we expect yeah. to see Randy walking around the corner and bending spoons and making things disappear. So it's yeah, what, it, I rem yeah, I remember when we invited him to Prague and to come and speak at the European Skeptics Congress, and that was then in Poland. Uh, I had the pleasure of just like spending an evening with him, just the two of us. And um, I was aware that like the next day he's going to have all these interviews and all these people there. So I didn't want to like badger him with all my questions. <laughs> uh, so I was just kind of talking about all kinds of things. And we just we had like goulash in a Czech restaurant and everything. And then he started like doing magic tricks. I did not ask him to do that, but it was <laughs> so nice. And I still I still have the napkin on which he wrote uh, the word from a random Czech book I picked up from a bookshelf behind me. Wow. And so I still have that. It's a really nice, unique souvenir to have. That's wonderful. It's certainly one of my strongest memories of James Randi, and this has got nothing to do with why I called you, but who cares, was um, <laughs> any time I'd, I'd have dinner with Randi or we're at a social event, all he needed was a table and an audience, and boom, he was gone. He was card tricks and making things disappear in the book trick, and he would do it for hours and yeah it's yeah we we really do miss uh, james the amazing randy but talking about seeing people at conventions and being at conventions of course i'm chatting to you because you're going to be appearing here in australia in december at the australian skeptics national convention what can you tell us about what you'll be talking about I am so excited. I can't wait. Um, I'm going to be talking about the role of skepticism in the changed world, uh, about how the skeptic movement has changed and developed, uh, how it's kind of changed its topics and hit its areas of interests uh, and widened them, and also how our approach as skeptics has changed to how we deal with the public or how we deal amongst ourselves. Uh, and also type of people that are in the skeptic movement, how that has changed throughout the times. And I'm also very excited to learn about the Australian skeptic movement because I've never been to Australia before. And I know only a few Australian mm -hmm. skeptics yourself, of course, Eran and now uh, Kevin Davies. And that's pretty much it. Oh, wow. So I look forward to meeting a lot, lots and lots of more Australian skeptics and finding out what it is that makes Australian skepticism different and unique. Ooh, I think that's something you'll just have to discover for yourself. I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> that's a really good question. Sometimes I wonder that myself, but what a good topic it is because yes, of course it's changed. It's changed a great deal. Even in the 20 years I've been involved, there are different topics come up, more important topics. Maybe we could say they're more important topics. When I first joined, it was still, um, you know, lo lots of classic topics, which are still important, but but not so common anymore, uh, common anymore, like the UFOs and the, and the monsters and things like that. And over the years, I've noticed it's certainly our, uh, our focus has been more and more drawn to consumer affairs and dangerous alternative medicines and things like that but it's a very very wide topic sure and not just that also for example in europe the question uh of uh, nuclear energy that's a very important mm. topic for the skeptic movement as well because there's so much misinformation and so much em emotional based decisions regarding that um and of course then the question of uh agriculture and, uh, for example, just glyphosate uh, and the conspiracies around that, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. not just, you know, GMOs. So, um, yeah, it, we really had to broaden our horizons and broaden our expertise and bring in new people from areas that we never really kind of thought of as yeah. um, areas we would be interested in before. But on the other hand, I think it kind of has taught us that skepticism is universally applicable to any topic you can imagine. Yeah, ab absolutely. And and I like the fact that there are new topics and things we can tackle because we can't be forever chasing UFOs. As, as fun as that is, we can't do that forever. Sure. Now, Claire, you, of course, you're the, uh, the president of the European Council of Skeptical Organizations. That's a very grand title. What does that mean? 
<laughs> so uh, essentially, I'm a skeptical bureaucrat, mm-hmm. um, <laughs> meaning that I I try uh, with various uh, degrees of success, of success um, to facilitate communication among skeptics uh, all across Europe. Mm-hmm. And to kind of um, pay attention to various trends in various countries and see how um, we can kind of help each other out because we are divided by language and geography, but mm-hmm. we are uh, united in what interests us and in, in our values. Uh, and it's sometimes almost a waste of time and money if there's a group working on something that some other group has already worked on, but un- there's un- an unfortunate amount of miscommunication or just no communication because we don't know that other groups are working on that same thing. So um, I try to kind of uh, pay attention to interesting projects going on, interesting personalities uh, interested, uh, who are working on certain topics and themes and bring everyone together. Wow. It sounds like a good job. It's, it sounds like something which is really, really interesting because the people you would meet, the people you would talk to, including our good friends at the the uh, ESP, the podcast, mm-hmm. and who will also be here in Australia. Folks, if you haven't yeah. got your tickets for Skepticon 2022 in Canberra, the uh, the beginning of December, just follow the link in this week's show notes. You'll have the opportunity to meet all sorts of fascinating people, including Claire Klingenberg. And Claire, if people wanted to uh, check out what you do, what's a good uh, website they can visit? They can check out my social media. Uh, I because I am building one, I mainly am based in Prague. Um, I generally use Twitter for my English content mm-hmm. and uh, Facebook half and half. And then uh, Instagram is mainly in Czech, but you're free to check that out as well. And you can also go to my website, clarek.com, where there's a mix of Czech and English content. Excellent. Folks, I'll add a link to that in this week's show notes. <laughs> but for now... Claire Klingenberg, thank you very much. Thank you. The Australian Skeptics Annual National Convention, Skepticon 2022, will be held on December 3rd through 4th, the first weekend of December. Go to the ticket sales page at skepticon.org.au to choose full in-person, one-day in-person, or streaming options. The event will be held at the National Library of Australia. The theme is Skepticism in a Changed World, and the lineup of speakers includes Claire Klingenberg, President of the European Council of Skeptical Organizations, the hosts of European Skeptics Podcast, and live stream talks by Skeptics Guide to the Universe host, Dr. Stephen Novella, and Skeptoid host, Brian Dunning. There is also a wide variety of domestic speakers, including Major General Mike Ryan, retired, who will be speaking on science fiction and security professionals, author David Dufty on Radio Girl, ACT Academy of Sports Psychologist Christine Dunn on Superstitions in Sport, controversial author Clive Hamilton on Being Censored, and many more scientific and skeptical topics. For full details, visit skepticon.org.au. year or so we've been bringing you the story of the Center for Inquiry and their legal action against the giant uh, U.S. department store Walmart and the pharmacy CVS over those institutions, those outlets selling homeopathy. A few months ago we had an update and now here's another update and this was via email from the Center for Inquiry Homeopathy on trial, Center for Inquiry, suits against Walmart and CVS on consumer fraud allowed to proceed. And it says, great news, we are going to get our day in court. 
On Thursday, a three-judge panel in the D.C. Court of Appeals reversed the dismissal of suits the Center for Inquiry brought against Walmart and CVS over claims that they deceived customers by marketing fake medicine as if it were real. Walmart and CVS shelve homeopathic products alongside real medicine. This placement is deceptive to consumers who can easily confuse it for scientifically tested products that provably work, which they are not. The Center for Inquiry suits have been dismissed by two lower D.C. courts, but yesterday, in a unanimous opinion written by Senior Judge Phyllis D. Thompson, the appeals court ruled that the placement of products on a store shelf does, in fact, communicate information to the consumers that they can rely upon and be deceived by. And if we scoot over to the Center for Inquiries website, there's more on this. Score one for the good guys. A major battle won in the continuing war on homeopathy fraud. And this is by Nick Little. I'll read some of this. And we've interviewed Nick Nick uh, Little on the show before under the title Reality versus Bloody Nonsense. <laughs> Opposing pseudoscience is consumer protection. We at the Center for Inquiry know that. You know that. And finally, the D.C. Court of Appeals has recognized that as well. It has been a long time since I argued the Center for Inquiry's case in front of the D.C. Court of Appeals in January, and an even longer time since we first briefed the appeals in both CFI versus CVS and CFI versus Walmart. Even by the glacial speed standards of the legal system, it has been a long delay. But this morning, finally, we got what we've been waiting for. The appeals court reversed and remanded the dismissal by the trial courts of our claims, and we can now go forward. You can read the decision here, and they provide a link. There are two key points to the decision. The first is on standing. The trial courts decided that CFI, Center for Inquiry, wasn't a consumer protection organization because although we have decades of history of work against pseudoscience, that work was theoretical, not consumer protection. According to the lower courts, we just wanted to show that homeopathy and Reiki healing and acupuncture and so on is bunk, and that's that. The appeals court, though, rejected this. It recognized that, quote, Center for Inquiry's mission-driven opposition to homeopathy as a pseudoscience and Center for Inquiry's efforts to remove homeopathic drugs from the market show that, at least in part, Center for Inquiry both is organized and operates to promote the interests of those who would be consumers of ineffective homeopathic products, end quote. And it says here, this is a really big deal. Had it gone the other way, our whole litigation campaign against homeopathy would have been hobbled. CFI, use of this DC law to challenge retailers and manufacturers depends unsurprisingly on the courts allowing us to do so. I will link to this page in this week's show notes. It goes on a bit longer. And towards the end, it says, the war still has a long way to go, but this battle has ended in a major victory. It's likely, I think, that both defendants will want to talk more seriously about a settlement and how they can avoid having to defend how they sell products they know are worthless in front of a jury. If they don't provide a real, impactful change to their behavior, then the case will continue. You can follow all our work in this area on the website for the Office of Consumer Protection from Pseudoscience. And there's a link. And there's a lot happening. Boyron, and we've covered Boyron before on the Skeptic Zone. That's a homeopathic uh, manufacturer in the United States. Boyron, the world's largest manufacturer of homeopathy, has officially answered our complaint. And there's another link. Spoiler alert. They disagree with our claims. <laughs> <laughs> what a shock. And the trial court has established a schedule for discovery and motions in the case. We've also sent letters to both Amazon.com and Chewy. C-H-E-W-Y. I'm not sure what that is. It's something new to me. What is that? Chewy. 
And that appears to be an online pet store for dog food, cat food, and pet accessories. Okay. And we pick it up, and Chewy uh, challenging the ways in which they recommend and promote homeopathic remedies for humans and animals. We're waiting on their responses. There's much more work to be done, but for today, we're enjoying being able to celebrate a win. Cheers, Nicholas Little. A good news story coming out of the Centre for Inquiry on the uh, the ongoing, as they say, the war against homeopathy. And it's a good win there for consumer protection. Again, you can read more about this update uh, by following the links in this week's show notes. Around 10% of Australians have seen a naturopath for one reason or another. Chances are you, someone you know, or that person over there, have visited a naturopath in the last year. But popularity isn't everything. Recent reports of a Sydney naturopath allegedly endangering the life of a baby, the son of a naturopath shunning radiotherapy for alternative therapies, and a disgraced Gold Coast doctor turning to naturopathy rather than maintaining her registration, raise the question, what's the deal with naturopathy? So what is naturopathy anyway? Trying to explain naturopathy is like trying to draw a sound. There's no definitive method, technique or remedy that you can point to and say, that's naturopathy. It comprises an astounding array of concepts centred around the idea that health can be maintained without surgery or drugs by enabling your body to heal itself. Naturopathy can include herbal, vitamin and mineral supplements, dietary advice, massage therapy, homeopathy, reflexology, kinesiology and many other approaches to optimum wellness. Rather than struggling with what naturopathy is, it might be easier to define what naturopathy isn't. Naturopathy isn't medicine. One of the major drawcards of naturopathy to those who are wary, disillusioned or downright terrified of doctors is that it provides a natural alternative to modern medicine. But it's tricky to ditch medicine without also discarding important things like standardised ethics and scientific evidence. Medicine represents the culmination of scientific knowledge over many lifetimes, constantly strengthening and correcting itself with data, measurement, controlled testing and published studies. Naturopathy represents centuries of traditional folklore, ancient wisdom, plants and a decent smattering of pan flutes. Even naturopathy isn't naturopathy. When you see a registered health practitioner you can assume you'll have more or less the same experience as you would with a different registered health practitioner of the same persuasion. There might be some variation in quality, manner, price and waiting room decor, but you'll generally get the same bang for your buck with one doctor or psychologist that you would with another. The thing is, unlike GPs, physios, orthopaedic surgeons, dentists, pharmacists and nurses, Naturopathy isn't standardised or independently regulated. There has been a gradual push for the regulation of naturopaths in Australia for several years, but little agreement between the industry's professional associations about what standards naturopathy should adhere to. As a result, your naturopath could be a university graduate giving out solid nutritional advice or a bored housewife with a massage table giving out sugar pills and liver failure. In Australia, both can legally call themselves naturopath and charge you money. Is naturopathy natural? Naturopathy is all about keeping healthcare as natural as possible. But is that always a good thing? Mother Nature can be a cruel old bitch at the best of times. Anyone who's ever had a broken rib or a face-eating virus can tell you that. Or mime it in the absence of a face. Of course, nature gives us lovely things too, like fresh fruit and vegetables. We just have to know which ones won't kill us. Navigating the perils of nature is difficult. Luckily, one group of people has done the hard work for us, testing nature to determine what can heal us and kill us, in what amount and when. That group of people is known as 
scientists. Does naturopathy work? An Australian government review of alternative therapies in 2015 found no clear evidence of effectiveness for naturopathy. However, with so many different practitioners, treatments and approaches huddled under one umbrella, it doesn't seem fair to say that naturopathy as a whole is effective or ineffective. Some naturopathic recommendations, like eating fresh vegetables and getting enough sleep, are scientifically proven no-brainers. Others, like homeopathy and coffee enemas, rely on outdated concepts of human health and have woefully inadequate evidence to back them up. Is naturopathy safe? Yes and no. No treatment with a measurable effect can be 100% safe. In medicine, naturopathy or any other health modality, a worthwhile practitioner will consider the relative risk and benefit of a therapy before offering it. A common danger of naturopathic remedies and recommendations, whether they work or not, is that they are commonly undertaken in place of proven medical treatments. Some naturopaths advise customers to forego other treatments, stop taking medications or avoid vaccination. When naturopathy turns bad. Naturopaths put themselves in a position that says, I can look after you. A lot of them take that position very seriously, care deeply about the quality of their work and practice within their skill set. Then there are the irresponsible, dodgy cowboys who abuse the trust and respect of their customers, abandon their duty of care and cause harm with their lack of scientific knowledge. In an unregulated industry, it's hard to choose a good naturopath over a bad one. Indeed, some customers have only discovered the consequences of their choice after their cancer has become untreatable. So here's my free, unqualified advice. Eat better, work less, see a doctor. The Skeptic, the journal from Australian skeptics. Subscribe online to the world's second oldest skeptical magazine. Just visit www.skeptics.com.au and click the magazine link. There you will also find, free to download, almost 40 years of back issues. The Skeptic, the journal from Australian skeptics, available as a physical copy or as a digital copy delivered to your inbox. Here's a story that came to my attention because I was checking out the Australian Skeptics Facebook page, Facebook posting, where the Australian Skeptics put up news and uh, bits and pieces of interest. And this is a report in the, the newspaper, the Sydney Morning Herald, dated the 23rd of September by Mary Ward. And I'll give you an overview of what it says. Alternative health clinics that don't comply with code of conduct, face closure. The state's health watchdog has been given the power to shut alternative health clinics, including naturopaths and chiropractors, for not complying with its code of conduct, as data shows an increasing number of complaints being made by patients. Powers that came into effect this month expand the role of the Health Care Complaints Commission, HCCC, to allow it to issue a prohibition order against an entire clinic rather than just an offending practitioner. New South Wales Health Minister Brad Hazard said the new rules, part of the Public Health Regulation 2022, would better protect patients in a growing area of health services. Quote, These changes enable the HCCC to use their powers to prohibit health organisations from operating where they pose a risk to the health or safety of the public. End quote, he said. Quote, this is an important additional step that enables the HCCC to take firm action to protect the community from health organisations which flout the rules and do not provide services in a safe and ethical way. End quote. Now, I'll just break in here to say 20 years ago, if I remember correctly, and there's a video on the YouTube channel of Australian Skeptics 20 years ago, 
I went to a press conference at the New South Wales State Parliament, and I was with all the the media, and I videoed the, the press conference, where the health minister of the day produced a range of quack devices on the table before him and said how he wants to ban these ridiculous quack devices. And 20 years later, uh, many of these quack devices are still in use. So we shall see what happens with this move. It goes on. While individual practitioners are already required to abide by a state code of conduct, the new regulation introduced a similar code requiring infectious control processes as well as duties to operate in a safe and ethical way for health organizations. I'll break in again and I'll say, I wonder if that means that people in naturopath clinics and chiropractic clinics and homeopaths and et cetera, who deal with the public, who deal with children, are required to be vaccinated. That would be interesting. Vaccination against, uh, well, primarily COVID-19 plus boosters. Later on, it says, in 2020 to 2021, the watchdog undertook investigations into 50 such practitioners, about a tenth of its total workload. It received more than 300 complaints about unregistered practitioners. The watchdog said this rise was, quote, driven largely by an increase in complaints relating to the professional conduct of massage therapists, assistants in nursing and counsellors when compared to previous years, end quote. CEO of the Australian Patients Association, Stephen Mason, said its organisation recognised alternative medicine as an important offering in the health space. Quote, But of course there are charlatans and rogues in every industry. But in the last year of two, it says, we have seen that with the various issues with cosmetic surgery, end quote, he said. He said alternative health organisations, quote, shouldn't be outside the scope, end quote, of the watchdog and praised the reform. Now, it's interesting to see that if we go back to the Australian Skeptics Facebook posting, and I'll add a link to the Australian Skeptics Facebook page in the show notes, we have a comment. Somebody has made a comment here about this posting. That would be par for the course for a health spokesman. Does not know the difference between his ass or his elbow, or for that matter, bacteria or a virus. Obviously, a micron and a nanometer are well beyond his comprehension, just as is the means of use. A surgical mask designed to stop bacteria has little chance of arresting a virus. Morons, total and utter morons, every one of them. Um. Well, that's a very uh, insightful and deep comment made there. We might be tempted to reply to that along the lines of, please restrict yourself to not using ad hominem attacks. But I've got a strange feeling that uh, this poster is a proponent of alternative medicine. So I don't think an argument with them would go very far. You may differ in your opinion. Well, needless to say, we'll keep an eye on this situation and see if any practitioners or clinics or whatever are prosecuted or at least investigated. I know my friends Ken McLeod and Ken Harvey will be very interested in this story indeed. For more on this story, check out the links in this week's show notes. Hello, this is Adrienne Hill from Canada, looking into historical articles not from Trove this time, but from newspaperarchive.com and newspapers.com about one of my favorite topics, as you know, ghosts. And more importantly, Canadian ghosts. Now, the first article I'm going to read is from page three of the Calgary Albertan on June 22nd, 1912. Author unknown. And the article is called City Hall is Haunted. City Hall is Haunted. In it, 
there is some unseen monster, a ghost or spook, a specter, ogre, or something dire and dreadful, which fights against the commissioners whom we have elected and forces them to do stranger and terrible things quite against their own wishes. If the Albertan ever insinuated by word, written or spoken, by thought, even, or printed picture that Commissioner Clark was the man in command who was ruling things with a high hand at the City Hall, it desires to get down upon its knees in humble fashion and apologize to its readers, for it all seems to be a mistake. Commissioner Clark appeared before the Commission on Wednesday and we find that he is the mildest mannered man that ever scuttled ship or sat in City Commission. He does not run the City Hall. He does not desire to run the City Hall. He does not even have a faint ray of ambition in his noble breast to make an impression upon City Hall affairs. Not only does he have no desire or remote wish to control, but it seems upon his own statement that he is the victim of some cruel domination from some force, name and description unknown, within the city walls. Mistakes have been made in municipal matters, mistakes both in policy and performance, and all because this unseen force, this sort of ghost, existence that no person can place his hands upon. The market building grew to full stature in ugliness and uselessness with Commissioner Clark perpetually and persistently remonstrating. Who is responsible? Commissioner Clark does not know. No person knows. It was the same with the gross and criminal neglect of the isolation hospital. It was the same with any other subject which has led to criticism. The commissioners were battling with the unseen force, this sort of demon unknown and unperceived. This leads us to believe that without doubt the city hall is haunted. There is something uncanny about it. For instance, it seems that every one of the commissioners objected to certain increases in salaries, and yet this ghost or spook or something like that wrestled with the three of them for three months and forced them to compromise. To live in a city which has a city hall that is haunted, though fearsome, is rather interesting. It gives lots of scope for the ambitious young man. We are looking for a mayor who can and will do things. If some strong person should go into the city hall, run the unseen influence to earth, stab it fiercely under the fifth rib, and drag it out by its hind legs, like St. George, he would make a hero of himself and stand a good chance for any preferment in sight. But until that time comes, we shall just keep on holding the commissioners responsible for all these shortcomings. It is hard to make some people believe that ghosts do exist, and exert an influence upon human beings. Commissioner Clark's evidence rather shakes the materialist and makes one believe that there are strange things which man has not thought of, Horatio. The citizens hold the commissioners responsible. When three men battle for three months to hold down certain salaries against some force they knew not of, and that hidden force puts them to earth, stamps its feet upon them, bruises their facts and forces them to compromise, that unseen force is something to reckon with. But that is a matter for the commissioners and not for the public. If there are ghosts in the city hall, the officials should have known about it before this. Encounters with the supernatural may be unpleasant, but if that goes with the job and is included with the paycheck, the officials have no ground for complaint. The public holds these men responsible for the neglect of the isolation hospital. It makes no difference what the medical health officer said or did. He is not an elected official. The public holds these men guilty for the pavement muddle. It holds them responsible for the market mix-up. It holds them responsible for every mistake in the city council. The idea of a commission is to centralize responsibility. If we are not to hold the commissioner responsible, why have them? It is up to them to deal with their subordinates. The public is not concerned with them. Well, I guess that's one way to justify unpopular decisions. Just say a ghost made me do it. And an interesting note, if you go to the City of Calgary website, they talk about the lore of the City Hall being haunted. Check out the show notes if you'd like to see for yourself. Next, we move forward in time to November 24th, 1996 with the Vancouver Province. 
Laura Shudiak wrote an article titled Haunted Hostelries, BC, Alberta, Have a Couple. This is a long article, so I chose only the part that talked about the Banff Springs Hotel, which is a beautiful hotel in the Canadian Rockies that was built by the Canadian Pacific Railway in 1888 and is quite close to where I live. There's a story that haunts visitors to the historic Banff Springs Hotel. It was just after the turn of the century, a young bride, arrayed in an elaborate wedding gown, walked down a spiral staircase to meet well-wishers in a nearby dining room. But on the staircase, she came too close to the burning candelabras. Her gown caught on fire. As she struggled to put out the flames, she fell to her death and her spirit became a ghost that still wanders the hotel. And just as an aside, according to the Royal Albert Museum in Edmonton, it is true that there was an awful fire in 1926 in the hotel, and it's true that many couples do get married at the hotel. However, there is no evidence that any brides have ever died at the hotel. It's a good story, admits Hollywood the director of public relations for the hotel. But I don't put a lot of stock in it. You see, the ghost of the poor bride hasn't appeared to many staff or guests. Woods calls it a legend. But until this year, the stairway she tumbled down has been boarded up. That's because noise from upstairs disturbed diners in the Rob Roy room, so a floor was put over the staircase. It could be seen from the dining room, but the steps led nowhere. Hmm, sounds a bit like the Winchester Mystery House. Now that the cast iron railing is back in place and the foyer restored to its original splendor, perhaps she will return to lament her early demise. And if she does, she'll join other ghosts that are said to inhabit the 100-year-old hotel. The most famous ghost is that of Sam McCauley, a longtime bellman who died in 1969. He was a great old guy. He always said to the staff that he would come back to make sure that they were doing their jobs, said Wood. There are many stories of luggage appearing when it was supposed to be lost, or on busy nights, luggage has miraculously arrived at the bell desk. When guests are asked who picked it up, they describe an older gentleman that matches Macaulay. Sam's widow is still alive and lives in Banff, said Wood. She was once asked if she thought that her husband was haunting the Banff Springs. She said it was a good thing he was up there, instead of at home bugging her. Wood hasn't seen or heard Macaulay personally, but that doesn't mean she doesn't think the place is haunted. Just after she started working at the hotel, she was delivering a guest basket to a room on the eighth floor. I went to put the key in the door and it pushed forward, said Wood. I thought there had to be a window open. But there wasn't. Nothing happened in the room, but I had a very odd sensation. What did happen was, when I went to leave, the cart was gone. I don't usually put people on the eighth floor. That's my own little superstition. So now, lastly, I will read from the Winnipeg Free Press from October 28, 2012, where Rosanna Schick wrote, Our spooky city, when ghost children started dancing, my skepticism flew out the window. When I was a kid, I had an infinite curiosity for ghost stories. I remember staying up way past bedtime to watch scary movies on TV or read Grimm's ghost stories by flashlight under the covers. They gave me goosebumps, yet I never felt afraid. Then I became an adult. These days, for whatever reason, I tend to avoid all things spooky. Horror films in the theater? No way. Paranormal shows on television? Forget about it. Frightening fiction? Not a chance. So I surprised myself recently by going to a haunted excursion. Muddy Waters Tours offers year-round outings that include three different dark tourism trips. Deciding it would be fun to be a tourist in my own city, I chose the Haunted Winnipeg Investigates Bus Tour, a three-hour adventure for the spirited personality. Time to get my Ghostbuster on. Part of me was definitely skeptical that we'd actually encounter ghosts. As I gathered with 18 strangers at Union Station, listening to host Kristen Varentruche explain what we'd be doing, my skepticism held strong. 
Our mission was to visit four Winnipeg locations suspected of being haunted and investigate using basic tools and techniques. It sounded like an exciting way to spend an evening, since I have a secret yearning to be a crime scene investigator. Kind of like Dexter, but minus the serial killer on the side part. Here was my chance to play detective, and I found myself thrilled by the chance to piece together some of our haunted history. I just hoped the ghosts would be friendly. As Varen Truche talked about sensations we might feel during the evening, like dizziness, changes in temperature, or even being touched, I also hoped they wouldn't be too friendly. As an aside, talk about priming. Don't worry, we've never had a ghost follow someone home, she joked. This was good to know because I once had a dog follow me home and it ended up staying for 16 years. I really didn't want another pet, especially one I couldn't see. Varen Truche showed us the tools we'd be using. Dowsing rods, pendulums, and K2 meters, machines that measure electromagnetic field activity. She also had an array of simple kids' toys and music on her phone. My skepticism was still strong, but I was willing to keep an open mind. <laughs> Hope her brain doesn't fall out. Be sure to take lots and lots of pictures, Varen Truche advised. Because that's often how we see spirit activity. Our first stop was the Manitoba Legislature, reputed to have a number of spirits roaming its hallowed marble halls. We gathered in a circle in the brightly lit hallway of the building, formerly opened in 1920, and armed ourselves with ghost-hunting weapons, er, tools. Varen Truche handed me the dowsing rods, gave out the K2 meters and pendulum, and placed some toys on the floor. Then she started asking questions, inquiring which spirits were present. When she asked if the spirit was a woman, the lights on the K2 meter flickered to orange and red. Weird, but not enough to convince me yet. The dowsing rods also started moving, but I really couldn't tell if it was the lady ghost or my lady nerves. The next stop was St. Boniface Museum. Built for the Grey Nuns who arrived in the Red River Colony in 1844, this is Winnipeg's oldest building, it's also downright eerie, and with a history steeped in sickness, death, war, and religion, it had to be the ideal location for reaching out to the other side. This time, we gathered in the darkness, with only flashlights casting dim light on our tools. As Varen Truche asked her questions, the K2 started flickering. This time, we had connected with a child, or possibly children. Since little ghosts apparently like music, together we sang Freda Jaca. They seemed to like it somewhat, as both the pendulum and K2 slightly indicated. Then, something chilling happened. Kirsten put a children's song called Promenade Nous dans les Bois on her speakerphone, put it on a small table in the middle of our circle, and informed the kids that if they liked the song, they could dance. At that moment, the K2 lights went wild. I felt a chill down my spine. At that moment, all my doubt flew out the window. I truly believed. My heart went out to the little ghost children who came to dance at our music in the middle of the dark museum. Whoever they were and wherever they came from, I hope they found some fun and maybe even some peace in our circle. And as much as I love kids, I also hoped they wouldn't follow me home. I'm guessing Kenny Biddle might have an explanation for how that K2 worked. Well, that's all for today. And if you want to spend some time going through spooky rabbit holes, then check out newspaperarchive.com, newspapers.com, and of course, trove.nla.gov.au. Until next time, this is Adrian Hill. Thank you for listening to the Skeptic Zone podcast this week. And thank you again, as I like to uh, thank people as often as I can, those people who contribute to the Skeptic Zone at Patreon or PayPal. In fact, I just got a new uh, Patreon subscriber from Canada just the other day. A big shout out to you. Thank you for coming on board. It's nice to uh, 
It's nice to think that people all around the world are hearing The Skeptic Zone and enjoying The Skeptic Zone, even if you are in the wilds of Canada. Thank you. No matter where you are around the world, thank you very much for contributing to The Skeptic Zone via Patreon or PayPal. And you can do that at skepticzone.tv. Coming up on next week's Skeptic Zone, the Trove segment looks at psychic surgery. And again, as a matter of fact, again, this is a report from Canada, a Canadian newspaper, the Winnipeg Free Press. And uh, it involves comments from James Randi. And just before I go, don't forget to check out the Skepticon 2022 website at skepticon.org.au. Claire Klingenberg will be there and a host of other international and local speakers. But for this week, this is Richard Saunders signing off from Sydney, Australia. You've been listening to the Skeptic Zone podcast. Please visit our website at www.skepticzone.tv for show notes, contacts, and to access the back catalogue of episodes going back to 2008. You can follow the Skeptic Zone podcast on Twitter at Skeptic Zone, visit our Facebook page, or leave a review on iTunes. You can also support the Skeptic Zone via Patreon or PayPal. The Skeptic Zone podcast is an independent production. The views and opinions expressed on the Skeptic Zone are not necessarily those of Australian skeptics or any other skeptical organization. Hello to all those people. Uh, Where is it? Here it is. Getting my dice machine here. Hello to all those people who listen to the end of the show for the dice game. This week I have a D10, a 10-sided die. It's, um, It's a black one. It's black with white letters. Letters? Numbers? What am I talking about? Black with white letters. Where's my skeptic zone pen? Ah, here it is. So I'm going to roll this die three times in the dice rolling machine, which sounds like that. Thank you, Greg Dore from California. And you have to use your psychic guessing magic dumb luck powers and see if you can uh, match the numbers that uh, come up on the die. Here we go. Rattle, rattle in the machine and seven. First number this week is a seven. Do it again. Last week, Maynard guessed two numbers out of three. He did very well. Hello, Maynard. Okay, here we go. Next number coming up. Five. A five for Susan Gerbeck, who loves to pick the number five whenever she listens to the game. Well done, Susan. And last uh, last throw of the die. Here we go. Ah, seven. Today's winning numbers. I don't know what you win. Today's winning numbers are 7, 5, and 7.